Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode one of MythCast, Mythopia's very own podcast channel. My name is Vince, and I'm one of the founders and creators in Mythopia. And this has been a project that we've been trying time and time again to get off the ground. Creating a podcast channel has always been something in the back of our minds as a way to engage people in a different way but also to explore things that you can't really explore with pictures and documents. So hopefully this is going to work, and I hope you enjoy today's episode called War Fever. Before we dive in, just a quick note. The subject matter is a bit on the darker side and deals with current events. If that's not your cup of tea at the moment, no worries, just turn off this podcast, and hopefully we can start off the next episode with something a little bit more agreeable. Finally, this episode is a hot take, so uh, don't expect too much from it, but I hope I can share some ideas that are educational and gets your mind rolling. Let's go. As many of you may know, Today, the 24th of February 2023, marks the anniversary of the beginning of the war in Ukraine. And it's got me thinking about all the emotions that go around war and conflict in general. And how, how does this conflict make me feel? As an individual, you know, I, I see the horrors that are going on over there and It's heartbreaking and it's terrible, but at the same time, there's some weird peaked interest about war and and conflict. And it's not just about the war in Ukraine, it's, it's about war in general. Like if you look around at the movies that we're watching from Star Wars to Avatar to the latest World War II movie, War seems to be part of those spectacular tentpole experiences. We also have the personal first-person shooter experience in games or strategic war games. When we talk about things, we also sometimes orient them towards this kind of warlike similarity, right? The war on drugs or two sports teams warring with one another. Corporate CEOs and stockbrokers will even attest to reading Sun Tzu's Art of War in order to help them in the businesses they run. So what is it about war that makes it so all-encompassing in our culture? Especially since most of us would agree that war isn't a good thing, not for personal health or for economic gain. So what is it about war that makes us keep coming back to it? Coming back to it to study it, to experience it in our entertainment. I recently came across this article called Losing the War by Lee Sandlin, published in the Chicago Reader in 1997. And he brings up some amazing points regarding conflict and its place in in a time of peace, a time we are experiencing now. A lot of what he talks about is that cognitive dissonance between the realms of war and peace, how soldiers coming back from battle would be unable to express themselves or explain what they've experienced because the language of that world is completely different from the one they come back to. But one of the things that really set me off down this rabbit hole was that in this article, he talks about his time when he was a child and how he and his schoolmates would go around the block and and pretend to be in a war with half the friends being on the side of the Axis and the other half being the Allies. And this brought back old memories of when I was a kid Back then, I used to live in this closed compound just outside of Dubai on a beachside front called Jumeirah Beach. And there were a couple of 
young kids as well that we would get together and go around the compound and just find things to do to pass the time. And one of those things was to pretend we were in a war zone. My question is, why a war zone? And who told us to, to reenact this? Thinking back, it, it's not so clear. I don't remember my parents telling me, you know, go out and pretend that you're in a war or anything of that sort. It just kind of naturally happened from the general cultural ideas that we were experiencing as kids growing up. That was the thing to do. And if we look back at history, this is something that other kids were doing. And it wasn't just play fighting and pretending to be in a war with your friends. It was toy soldiers or using BB guns. Did you guys have BB guns when you were a kid? I remember that was such a big thing and we would, you know, go and buy the latest BB gun and show it off to, to the rest of the kids. Why were my parents allowing me to buy BB guns? Anyway, uh, that's going off topic. Back to the article, Lee Sandlin brings up some really captivating ideas and terms. He basically goes through the entire Second World War in a brief summary with little pinpoints of knowledge from this era and that era. One of the terms that really resounded with me was this idea of war fever. And it basically signifies one's excitement to go to war. This goes back to the ancient civilizations, at least in the Western world. The ancient Greek city-states believed that the war was merely a part of life. Lee mentions that the idea of a long peace without war would have seemed alien to them. And you see this in museums, with Greek pottery and artwork, usually depicting heroic figures with shields and swords and spears, the very arsenal of a soldier, and the tools of war. This fact even appears in the surviving works of the time. For example, the Odyssey is about soldiers trying to return home from a successful battle. This trend continues on with the Roman legacy. In the Aeneid by Virgil, we have war in the beginning of the story with the fall of Troy and war at the very end, where our hero falls in the fields of Italy. Moving a couple of centuries to the 1100s, we had the Vikings who had war in their veins, inventing war-centric words to define the experiences of the battlefield, from terms like Berserker, meant to represent men instilled with the rage of battle, to fey, for those who fall in despair. From the medieval ages up until the 19th century, we see combat evolve. Codes of conduct, chivalry, bushido. Swords and bows give way to guns and cannons. Yet even with these sweeping changes, the captivation and the allure of war seems to like Fallout likes to say, never change. Fast forwarding to the 20th century, humanity faces two of the greatest wars known to living history. With the First World War in 1914, European youths were jubilant to enlist and join in the battle. They'd come home by Christmas, they said. Battlefield picnics and tours took place to allow civilians a first-hand experience into the conflict. These are the feelings that would be associated with the idea of war fever. And such elements are still alive and well today, with round-the-clock news updates about the war in Ukraine, countless new channels on YouTube and online that try to explain the conflict in further detail. Recently, a 2022 remake of All Quiet on the Western Front won Best Picture at the BAFTAs, and it's a great example of a modern anti-war film, but also shows the trappings of this idea of war fever. The story follows Paul Balmer and his fellow schoolmates as they enlist for the war. What entails is a coming-of-age story 
of horrors unimaginable. But in the very beginning, you see how these young kids are being manipulated and turned towards the battlefront and how they go off in excitement and are singing their way to the front lines. I remember reading about this idea that war is cyclical and that major conflicts usually recur every hundred years. And that's because that is just enough time for the idea of the conflict, the horrors of the conflict, of the previous conflict, to be forgotten. Sandlin brings up this point as well in his article, talking about how people today might know the huge events that happened during the Second World War, like D-Day or Dunkirk, but they may not necessarily remember the finer points of that conflict, and that in future generations, even the major events like D-Day and Dunkirk may be lost in time simply due to the fact that more history is being made and those past events are now too far behind to really have a valid reason to be remembered. But let's return back to the idea of being an audience member in a Odeon cinema, going to watch a movie, and as we're watching it, the ideas of conflict and war are just being thrown into our face. What is it about it that we like? Well, first off, it's the conflict, the drama. We are naturally predisposed to, to look for gossip, to look for that drama, not just out in the world, but, you know, in the lives of our friends and our family members. We're attracted to drama, and war is just the nth degree of that. It is the escalation of drama to its ultimate form conflict between millions of people. Not to mention, for many of us, war is not part of our daily lives. And seeing such stories is a different perspective. It's a different avenue of experience. And it's a novel experience, since many of us would not have experienced combat in our lifetime. Aside from that, there are the standard tropes of, of going to war. The idea of adventure. The U.S. Army likes to play on this a lot with new recruits. Why not travel the world with us? It's free. This idea of globetrotting around the world is a great opportunity for a storyteller, being able to put characters or the protagonist in new environments and places and get them to experience things that are unique and culturally significant. Of course, there's also the camaraderie. The show Band of Brothers really plays on this idea of a kinship between soldiers being a stronger bond than anything else that may exist in normal society. There's also the grand achievements and the legacy. These acts, these feats that are larger than life, that can only be achieved by a large group of people. Think of the march of Alexander the Great across Asia, or Genghis Khan, Caesar, Napoleon. These figureheads that have been propped up by huge armies. We like the idea of things being epic, extraordinary, larger than life. But over the last decades of the 20th century, there has been a counterpoint to this idea of war fever. With the onset of the Vietnam War, there was a sharp increase in protests against war. Global conflicts were seen with a more critical eye, and people actively fought against the draft and the idea of going to combat. There was also a big change because of the amount of footage and material that was coming back from the war front, providing a less censored experience of what the conflict was actually like. With the war in Ukraine, this unfettered access has allowed us to take a glimpse into what modern war looks like. But unlike the Vietnam War, it hasn't been a major motivator to anti-war movements as the Vietnam War itself. And that's partly due to the fact that the war in Ukraine is one for survival, a survival against the tyranny that is known. 
something akin to the Second World War. A lot of historians like to call the Second World War the just war, one where the sides are clear-cut. The enemy is revealed for the world to see in the form manifest of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. The call has been strong, and from all over the world, people have gathered to Ukraine to help join the fight. Does this count as war fever? Probably not, because this kind of motivation comes from the idea of fulfilling a duty, a call, a requirement, and not necessarily going to battle for the sheer excitement of conflict. A more accurate representation of war fever would be the real-life example of Mad Jack Churchill, a soldier during the Second World War. He is a notorious individual in the Second World War narrative. Among his many exploits, he is known for charging the beaches with a set of bagpipes, playing the song March of the Cameron Men. He's also been known to go into battle with a claymore and has allegedly shot a German soldier with a bow. With the conclusion of the European theater of conflict, he decided to make his way to Japan and expressed his aggravation when the Japanese surrendered, cursing the Americans for dropping the bomb and closing the conflict too soon. From interviews with Mad Jack Churchill, he doesn't seem to pass off as one of those lunatics like Roland Weary in Slaughterhouse-Five, which is one of those unusual contradictions. Another question that we need to ask ourselves is, if we stop with the war stories, will we stop going to war? Or is that just an integral part of nature and humanity, and that no matter what we do, we will just continue down this path? There's also the question of the strange dichotomy of the war anti-war film. Movies like The Hurt Locker, which show the horrors of conflict, but at the same time are, are unapologetic about the glorification of combat. And the main takeaway from the movie? War is a drug. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. I hope you enjoyed this short episode on MythCast. Hopefully we can do a little bit more, um, something a little bit on the lighter side of things next time. But until then, please do check out. We are running a Kickstarter campaign for Glow 5 and 6 running right now on Kickstarter. If you want to go take a look, we would be greatly appreciative. Also, check out our new stuff on myth.works. That is a link to our website where you can find the first four issues of GLOW in a lovely hardcover book. We also have some RPG games and a Mythopia Presents section where we show off things that we really like. Also, a big thank you to our patrons over at Patreon. You guys are rock stars, and if you haven't already, do check out the Myth Monthlies. Uh, there is some really cool stuff in there for you. I hope you enjoy them, and until next time, stay safe.